In August and September this year, I was facilitating Halos and Horns, an introduction to eschatology. Now, eschatology is a theological word that literally means the study of the last. It's a catch-all term for everything related to death, heaven, hell, judgment, salvation, you know, all the easy questions of faith. And so, over six weeks, we explored a bunch of these topics, and if I had to identify one biblical passage that came up the most, it was this one. Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. This parable is, more often than not, the poster child for traditional eschatological thinking. And on the surface, it seems pretty simple. There is a judgment day, there is a heaven and a hell, and you will ultimately end up in one or the other. Case closed, what's for dinner? But as is the case with most, if not all, of Jesus' parables, is that there is more than meets the eye. We can't just stay on the surface, we do need to dig deeper. Now it's worth noting that this story isn't alone in presenting a seemingly dualistic understanding of the afterlife. There are others. The problem is that the church has often, so often converged to this one dualistic understanding of eschatology as the only way to think about it. And yet, if you remember my sermon from a month or so ago, when we had heard a different parable of Jesus, the workers in the vineyard, one that offers an alternative concept of the afterlife, more akin to universalism. And that one is not alone either. There are others. My point is that there are differing understandings of eschatology, of afterlife, of judgment and salvation in the Bible itself. And I believe that the reason there are differing understandings is that ultimately we do not know. We don't know what happens next. No one does. Not for sure. Scripture offers us some possibilities, but no certainty. And this has proved difficult for the church through time, so it has adopted positions of certainty, claimed them as doctrine, because we struggle with uncertainty. We want to know Now, if you find this challenging, that is absolutely okay. Because when long-held views are questioned or challenged, that can make us uncomfortable. The important thing is not to suppress it. Instead, talk about it. Talk with friends, talk to Radhika or myself or whomever you find support. And if what you need is to hold on to your current understanding of heaven or hell, of judgment, of salvation, that's okay as well. But what I would ask you to think about is how what you believe about all this, how does that impact the way in which you live? Essentially, that's why eschatology is so important, why talking about it is so important, even if we sit in the uncertainty, because what we think about eschatology will shape our ethics. It will shape the way in which we engage in the world, shape the way in which we live our lives. For some... Their eschatology is primarily primarily shaped by fear. Fear of missing out on heaven, fear of going to hell. And if that's the case, that fear will, either consciously or subconsciously, shape how you live. For me, my sense of eschatology begins with the vision from Paul's letter to the Colossians in chapter 1. For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell... And through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to God all things. For in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to God all things. The reconciliation of all things to God is the basis for my eschatology and shapes how I live because I live or at least try to live with that spirit of reconciliation in all that I do. It's a bit like the quote from Martin Luther. Even if I knew that tomorrow would go to pieces, that knew tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. Even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. We can't achieve the reconciliation of all things by ourselves, but we can be part of it. And this idea is also a formative part of the Uniting Church. Our founding document, The Basis of Union, says this in paragraph three. 
God in Christ has given all people in the church the Holy Spirit as a pledge and foretaste of that coming reconciliation and renewal, which is the end in view for the whole creation. So for the Uniting Church, it is the Holy Spirit. It is God's presence in the world that we can, through which we can glimpse God's intentions that all things might be reconciled to God. And that is entirely the work of God. The reality is that one way or another, what happens next is out of our control. What we can control is how we live in the here and now how we might participate in the work of renewal and reconciliation. And I think that's a good segue for us to return to our Bible reading. Because what if the parable is less about what is happens next, but instead about what we do now? What is, this, is a, this story of Jesus is about pointing towards what people who live for reconciliation and renewal might look like. Let's break the story down a little bit. First, the story talks about all the nations... This isn't about a particular subset of humanity, a particular religion. This isn't just for Christians. This is imagined for everyone. And next, the test, as it were, comes afterwards. And what is clear that the people don't actually know about it, or at least the conditions involved until after the fact. They don't know what basis this judgment would happen. Both the so-called sheep and goats are surprised at the outcome and ask the king on how it comes to be. And perhaps most importantly, we need to think about the actual conditions. And to put it simply, the basis for this test is how people care for one another. Feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and imprisoned. Where it gets interesting for me is when we think about motivation. I don't think we can say that the people were motivated by the prospects of heaven and hell because they were unaware of the conditions. Those who showed compassion and care for their neighbour didn't do it for an eternal reward. They did it because it was the right thing to do. Perhaps the most poignant part of the story comes from the words of the king, who we can safely assume to be Jesus. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. And with these beautiful words come an incredible challenge for us all. And that is the challenge of seeing God in the face of the other. To see the way that we treat others is ultimately a reflection on how we treat God. And this isn't just a nice feel-good image. This is what the embodiment of Jesus is about. Jesus, at time, was homeless. Jesus, I'm sure, was hungry. Jesus was in prison. Jesus was naked. The amazing reality of the incarnation that God in Christ came to be with us to experience with us the fullness of life, both the good and the bad. So for those who use this parable as core for an understanding of a dualistic afterlife and judgment, I do find it interesting that the conditions of this parable are frequently ignored. Rarely we would hear that the basis for our going to heaven or to hell was based on how we treat others, and in particular, how we treat the most vulnerable in our world. In fact, there's a huge theological debate across centuries around this issue, issue usually referred to justification by faith. And it's one of the catalysts of the Protestant Reformation. One of the big objections of Martin Luther was the practice within the Roman Catholic Church at the time of indulgences, by which you could pay money to the church and be assured of an eternal reward. Luther's uh, refutation of this was that we cannot earn or buy our way into heaven or out of hell. That would be called what, what is called a justification by works and has for the most part been rejected by much of the Christian church. Now the justification by work, by faith or by works debate is fascinating. And it's a worthwhile conversation to have, but not particularly where I want us to focus today. Instead, I want us to consider that if we are going to take this parable literally as a basis for a dualistic afterlife and judgment, we have to take all of it. And I don't think we can. 
I don't think we can take it literally, and I don't think we should take any particular parable and build a theology from it alone. It helps me to think of parables as glimpses, peeks into the incomprehensibility of the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew would say. They offer us truth nuggets that can help us navigate the worlds of life and faith. The kingdom of God is like the seed in the, seed in the soil. It's like a treasure hidden in the field. It's the pearl of great value. It's the mustard seed. It's the net. And the kingdom of God is not only something for the future. Instead, we will talk about it in terms of the paradox, that it is both here and now and still to come. But as we've said, if we don't control the still to come... What is left is the here and now. And so, rather than this being a parable about what happens next, think about it, about it in terms of a parable about what is happening now. When we think about what it means to follow Jesus, we know how do we treat others is central. It comes through most clearly in the story of the greatest commandments, which is actually two commandments, where Jesus says, the most important thing for us to do is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and to love your neighbour as yourself. And so what this parable is doing is actually reinforcing what we already know, that it matters to God how we treat others, how we show love to our neighbour. The parable hammers home the point by reminding us that the other that we encounter should be seen as if we are seeing God themselves. Friends, this Sunday marks the end of the liturgical year. For the church, the year begins with the season of Advent, which we will enter into next week. And in following the liturgical calendar, what we discover are certain rhythms to the year. In Advent, for example, we await the coming of Jesus at Christmas. In Lent, we immerse ourselves in the grief and uncertainty of the impending suffering and death of Jesus at Good Friday and the amazing revelation of resurrection at Easter. But even in the midst of this time, which is known as ordinary time for some reason, we can see a rhythm, and it's one of contemplating what is next and ultimately what is the purpose of life. Think back to the stories that we've heard over the last month or so. The parable of the talents, the parable of the bridesmaids, the greatest commandment, whether to to pay taxes to the emperor. All of these stories, in their own way, invite us to think about what it's all about and subsequently what kind of lives we're going to live. None of us can answer the question of what comes next, not with absolute certainty. We can hope and we should. We can dream, and we should. And in those hopes and dreams, we should discover the motivation to live for today, to live as part of God's dream. There's a quote that's making its rounds on social media that comes in part from the Hebrew Scriptures and part from the Jewish Talmud, and it says, Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justice now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. This reminds us, just like our parable, that whilst there is so much that we cannot control in the world, there are some things that we can. We can control how we act, how we respond, how we live as disciples of Jesus. Still shocks me a little bit when I realise that Radhika and I are coming to the end of five years here at Luck. How did that happen? When did that happen? It has been a wild ride and we're both so glad that we are here to live and work amongst you all. And I think one of the reasons that we are so happy here is the way in which this community chooses to live. Because I don't think this community chooses to live out of fear of what might be. I think this community chooses to live out of the hope of what could be. And I've seen it time and time again as people engage in intentional learning about faith 
and atonement and eschatology, as people march in Mardi Gras and attend climate rallies, as people work so hard for the Yes campaign in the recent referendum. This is all kingdom work. That in spite of the challenges of our world, we do not lose hope, but continue to work for God's reconciliation and renewal of all things. Friends, you are a blessing. So I encourage you to keep going. Be a blessing to the world. In the name of the risen, crucified one. Amen.